Okay, so um, our speaker today is Laurie Holliday. Laurie used to work in the corporate world. Now, we've just been asking him about what he meant exactly by the corporate world. And uh, I think you won't mind me saying that he used to work for uh, Liverpool, Victoria, and JP Morgan. But he got out of the, uh, the grip of, of corporate finance and made his way into life coaching. So he's going to tell us what that's all about and how he made that journey. Everyone has to be on a journey now, don't they? Um, I have a bit of a, a joke with my husband when we're listening to the radio at lunchtime. It's only, it only it takes about two minutes before someone comes on and they say, I've been on a journey you now. So we all have to have a journey instead. Anyway, Laurie is going to tell us about his. He's also going to talk to us about different stages of life and how our needs and priorities change through life and he's going to talk to us about how to make meaningful changes in our lives using a framework that he calls the five pillars, which sounds a little bit like Islam, does it? The five pillars. But he's, he's already told me he's not religious, so don't worry about that. Um, will you please give Laurie a warm welcome?
and they hired me to help some of their clients um, who were recovering potentially from strokes, who were experiencing dementia, who were simply elderly and frail and needed some support to help them with acts of daily living. And working with this demographic and actually seeing the difference that I was able to make with simple human contact was one of the most transformative experiences in my life. And I became sort of deeply concerned and connected with the human condition through spending time with people who were vulnerable and in need and seeing their suffering and seeing some of them deal with it with incredible courage and strength of character and equally seeing some who on paper had a lot of things going for them but equally were deeply dissatisfied and unhappy with their lots. And so this really got me super interested in, in the human condition more broadly and in psychology. And so I took my personal training and I extended my coaching skills and I became a life coach. I became obsessed with finding practical tools to help people change their circumstances, their mental state, and put themselves into a more productive mode of being for want of a better word. So I trained in neurolinguistic programming as a therapist, I trained in cognitive behavioural therapy, I've become very interested in the practice of mindfulness, and I've recently qualified as an MBSR instructor in mindfulness as well. So I do breath work too, that's another thing that we all can do ourselves. I don't like the culture that we have of reaching for the bottle of pills or for the wonder food or whatever product it might be. It's always someone trying to sell you a reusable item that you need to keep consuming to improve your sense of well-being. But I'm firmly of the opinion and I'm, the tools that I explore and continue to explore are all about the ability that we have to improve our own well-being. And that's really where this sort of five pillars of well-being concept comes from. So, that's a little bit about me. So, what, what is a life coach? So, a life coach is essentially a strategic partner, um, a, 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 a supportive guide or possibly even friend who can help you achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And these can be personal goals, professional goals, they might be to do with the physical elements of your life, depending on the, the qualifications of the, the life coach themselves. It might actually be some mental health features that you're looking to access, again, depending on the experience of the coach that you're dealing with. Oftentimes, the, the barriers to our ability to change are psychological. It's fundamentally down to whether we think we can change. Right? And that, that really is a fundamental question to ask yourself. And it applies to lots of areas of your life. Right? Because there are some things that we are convinced we can't change in our lives. And there are some things that we might accept that we can. And we might be right or wrong about either of those things. But oftentimes, we don't even think we can change. It doesn't even occur to us that an element of our personality might be adjustable, that we might not be able to be as angry as we normally are, that we might find a way to separate ourselves from some of our sadness if that's a pattern of behaviour for us. So it's helping people realise that change is possible and then asking them, do they want to change? That's the other fundamental question when it comes to change. You can, you know, Someone can believe they can change, and you can give them all the tools, but they don't necessarily want to. And there can be strong psychological things underpinning that. We are very connected to our sense of self, and trying to deviate from that takes an awful lot of mental effort, an awful lot of focus, and we're very resistant to that. Uh, it's, it's likened to a jungle, and it's one of the analogies I've got in my, my notes there at the top. Our brain is this sort of neural net of wonderful bits and pieces. It's very scientific. <laughs> and as we learn things, 
we're forging our way into the jungle of the mind and we're creating paths that we will then repeat if they're successful or turn away from if they're not. So when we're building new behaviours, we are hacking through a new path in the mind. And that's well and good, and that's fine. And the more we do that behaviour, the more we repeat, the more we practice, the wider the path becomes, the more established it becomes. It becomes a wider trail, a road, a motorway, those sorts of concepts. But the problem is that when there's a disaster in our life, when there's an emergency, when there's a fire in the jungle, what do we do? We go instantly back to the roots that we've trodden so well, that we're so familiar with. So we can be super rational and super focused on our new behaviours, whatever they are, whether it's a, a nutritional change we're trying to elicit in ourselves, whether it's a pattern of physical activity, or whether it's trying to conquer our, our anger or a sense of overwhelming sadness or change a job. We can do all those things when we feel calm and when we feel safe. But as soon as things get really complicated for us, as soon as uncertainty kicks in, we're likely to fall back onto our old patterns of behaviour that we know work almost immediately. And you'll go back to the cake, or go back to the job that we know, the relationship that we know, all those things because they're comfortable. Even if they're not great for us, even if they're not ideal, but we know there are no entity. There are no entity. So yeah, so Life Coach, Mental Health Coach will help you create a framework to execute the goals that you want to execute. Give you the mental tools and tips to help try and keep you focused and give you the reassurance that actually you're not broken when you fall off the wagon a little bit with your behaviours and your habits. It's something that we all do. It's almost impossible not to regress back into an old behaviour and habits. So the critical thing is that you don't abandon your efforts at that point and you accept that you just pick up and start again, which is a very mindful approach to things if it's something you're familiar with. So just turning some of the talk notes, one of the key things I mean, at the top of my list for, and we've sort of talked about this a little bit already, but the know thyself adage, right? The path to successful change starts with being detective in your own life. Being curious about how you behave, what you do, what gets you interested, what really doesn't excite you. Being curious about your circumstances is a really strong, critical step to making any change. What it will help you do is it will help you recognise perhaps why you're doing a behaviour, because that really is more important than the behaviour itself. We do everything for a reason. Nothing we do is random, even if it appears random. It's not random. Okay, we are doing something because it gives us something or it protects us from something in some way. So by being curious as to the circumstances in which a behaviour is triggered, what happens, what's the context in which that behaviour is arising, that will help us build a pattern that we can then understand <coughs> and then look to change. I'd also like to just sort of reinforce or share with you my personal belief that self-care and self-development are not selfish. And I think there's a historical, uh, often probably from our childhood, this sort of tendency to think that focusing on ourselves is somehow a selfish act, is something we shouldn't be doing, we should be selfless. And being selfless is about not taking care of ourselves but we're instead prioritising the care and well-being of others. But what I've realised, and I've seen this directly through working with, with the clients that I've been working with, is that if we don't take care of ourselves properly, then we really aren't in the optimal place to take care of others. 
So we actually owe it to others to take care of ourselves as best we can. And as Jordan Peterson is fond of saying, we're actually too powerful to ignore that responsibility to take care of ourselves properly. If we're not nourishing ourselves properly, if we're not looking to improve ourselves in key ways, then we run the risk of falling foul to sort of anger and negative patterns that become dis disruptive and destructive to people around us. So I think there really is a very human obligation on all of us to try and be the best that we can for ourselves and for others without flogging ourselves to death in the process. And one of the key methods of affecting successful change is to start small, baby steps. We kind of forget the significance of childhood learning processes as we're adults. We think we can just kind of bypass all of that process. But actually, it's a super effective way of learning. And it's natural, it's intuitive, and it's far more likely to succeed. What we do when we want to change typically is we go full hog, we ditch all the alcohol, we cut out all the cakes, we start running a marathon every week. And what happens? It kills us, right? It overwhelms us. There's not many times where people are successful going cold turkey with the behavior. There really isn't. Start stupidly small and stupidly simple and recognize the success and build on it. And that's a key concept at any stage of life, particularly the older we get, when our habits are already more deeply ingrained. So we are very much machines of, uh, of, of habit repetition. Right? It, 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 we, we really are. You, you are greater than the person you were yesterday, at sound access, or worse than that effect. We repeat the activities and we become what we repeat. And the more we do it, the more those paths in the jungle of our mind become established, become entrenched, and it becomes difficult to deviate from them. Our routine, you know, think about brushing your teeth in the morning, for example. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to put your hand up if you don't. But, you know, you just automatically, probably, brush your teeth in the morning. You go for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea in the morning. You don't even have to think about it. And in fact, you have to think really hard not to do it. And it's the same with driving a car, for example, right? The first time you start to drive a car, it's an absolute nightmare. It's really difficult. You think about everything, your gears is going in the wrong place, you're clutching wrong. It's a nightmare. You hate it. You're really stressed and wired. And now you can do it virtually asleep, and most of you probably do. <laughs> so, it really is, and the more we do these things, the more intense they become. So, Later in life, when we're trying to make changes, we need to be that little bit more gentle, that little bit more considerate to ourselves, make small, achievable goals that we can stick to and succeed at and repeat. So that means for exercise, for example, it means don't pick a starting workout so tough that you're so broken that you can't do another workout for a week. People do this all the time. And they pay personal trainers to do it to them. It's fantastic. Because people think, if my body isn't broken, then I haven't done a proper workout. That's great when you're 12. Right? But it's not so very productive when you're 50 or 40 or 60 or 70. Right? You need to be functioning. <laughs> you need to be safe. And you need to be willing to do it again. So if it becomes too much, too overwhelming, What's going to happen? It's going to put you off, you're not going to want to do it. So, our, our needs and our, and our, our, our needs and what we're looking for in life do change on the journey of our life, the journey we're having. And, and, and it should be looked at in some sense as a journey. Because we want to be evolving or growing in some way. Because if we're not, we become stagnant. And it's very difficult to find the charm in life if we don't see a future for us. 
And I think this is one of the huge existential threats facing our, our young population at the moment, the kids at school and the young adults, is that the world that they see is just filled with a lack of hope. The environment disasters, the situation in Ukraine, the threats of China or an asteroid or you know, whatever dinosaurs coming back if they can't find anything else. There will always be something in the media cycle to point out how terrible everything is in the world. And so if we don't find a personal and appropriate way to grow, to hold our journey, then it's very easy to, to succumb to despair and overwhelm. And I really do feel that our young have a really big challenge in that respect with the, the social media environment they find themselves in, for all the wonders of it as well, right? And all these technologies have brilliant elements, but obviously, like all technologies, they come with a, a severe risk of being uh, misused, abused, or negative consequences. So, we do have different requirements, we have different beliefs about ourselves at different stages in life. And the things that are important to us change dramatically through our life. I read a really interesting book by a doctor, an American geriatrician called Atoll Wangbe, called Being Mortal, and it might be one that some of you have already read or come across. And he, his work was really exploring the quality of experience that people look for at end of life and when they have life-threatening illnesses. And what that really focuses them on is the, the desire for human connection, the need to bring your family, whatever that is for you, closer to you in those circumstances. When we're fit and well and we think that life has a long horizon, we're more likely to feel independent, we're more likely to want our space, the opportunity to explore the world however that is for us, however that manifests for us. But as we move towards the later stages of life, the end of life circumstances, or if we're a young person who finds themselves, unfortunately, with a very serious illness or circumstance like that, it really does flip the perspectives of what's important to you and what you want to do in your life. So what I invite you to consider is, if you haven't already, is actually what, what you value in your life and actually try and write it down because oftentimes these things are lost in our heads and we take them for granted that we actually know what's important to us, what we value in life. But have you ever really thought about it or how much time have you given to thinking about it? And perhaps, you know, this group here, being more interested in the human condition, perhaps you guys have actually spent more time doing that sort of behaviour. But if you haven't, or if you haven't done it recently, I would urge you to consider what in life is actually meaningful to you. What connections mean the most? What activities do you really enjoy? And conversely, what activities do you hate? What activities are you wasting your time with, in quotes? What relationships are you struggling through? And is there any way to maybe adjust those relationships, change those circumstances? We can't control everything that happens in life. We can't control the people necessarily that we have to come in contact with. We can't control the activities we, we can or can't do. Right? We don't have that sense of free will that we think we do necessarily. But if we actually document somewhere, make a note for ourselves of what's important to us and what's irritating to us, it gives us a framework to start building from. Again, rather than just being lost in the jungle of the chaos of our lives, the busyness of things going on, just existing, we can actually apply a structured plan if you want to. But if you actually want to make changes to your life, if there are areas that you want to focus on to address, to adjust, then actually having a simple structure, a document, a working framework that you're going to use to support you, to keep your mind focused on what you're looking to achieve, is an incredibly useful thing to have. Is there 
questions at the moment before I continue. And there will be Q&A at the end. So I don't want to cause, I don't want to disrupt anything. But if anyone's got any thoughts in the meantime, just shout out. So, the five pillars of well-being. So again, just to remind you, I think everything that we do um, should, sorry, everything we do, I guess I said, that there are things that we can do to really improve our well-being and the state of the life that we have are within our control. Okay? Not everything, some things are beyond our control. Life throws curveballs at us. But these five pillars of well-being are things that we are able to influence to a lesser or to a greater degree should we choose to. And they're all, these are on page two of your notes. And I've got two colourful circles, one with hexagons and one with uh, circles. And it's the circles on the right hand side. So they're not in any particular order. And there's no one that trumps the other, okay? But they all kind of work together, overlap, intertwine, and, and support each other in a lot of contexts. So the one at the top there, the first one we're talking about, is the breath. Simply breathing. And you all know how to breathe. You've been doing it since you were born, and you'll do it till you die, I know. But there are ways to breathe better. And many of us are breathing dysfunctionally. And when we don't breathe efficiently, we can create a physiological state of stress in the body. This can encourage us to feel anxious or angry, and it can result in high blood pressure, which can ultimately lead to things like heart disease, all good, fun, wholesome stuff. And this is all potentially caused by continual dysfunctional breathing, typically over-breathing, and typically mouth-breathing. So what I'd encourage you to experiment with, and if we've got time, we'll do a little breath exercise. <laughs> but you'll <to> see. <laughs> I'll do a little breath exercise, which is calming and relaxing, when there's nice warm room with soft light. But I'd encourage you to breathe less, believe it or not. Okay? And I'd encourage you to breathe through your nose, if at all possible. All right. So, what happens when we breathe slowly through the nose? None of this should be causing stress, okay? We're not trying to, we're not trying to challenge ourselves with a record-breaking breath hold or anything like that. We're just slowing the breath down and focus on it. And again, this is a very mindful practice, so some of you may have already done this, either through, through yoga or through mindfulness, should you practice anything like that or meditation. But actually focusing on the physical experience of breathing, can't put my hand up in there, why am I? <laughs> it causes all sorts of issues. The physical sense of, <laughs> of breathing at the tip of the nose. So you might notice slightly cooler air coming into the nose, slightly warmer air leaving again. You might notice a change of sensations across the bridge of the nose, into the cheeks, into the throat. You're not imagining any of this. I'm not asking you to create what you think breathing feels like. You're again simply bringing the attitude of curiosity to the experience of the breath. Now the handy thing about this is you can do this anywhere and nobody knows it. So this is actually a really super calming exercise. So if you're getting frustrated in say supermarket queue, I get frustrated in supermarket queues. You can focus on your breath. And nobody will notice. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to make any noise. You don't have to say any incantation. You're just breathing. Super simple. Super effective. The other thing you can do with breathing is humming. Now, humming can be very irritating to people around you. But from a breathing perspective, it's super efficient. So when you hum, and you can be do a tune if you like, or you can do a, a toneless hum as you prefer. What you do is you're building up a lovely little gas called nitric oxide in the sinus cavities. And nitric oxide is a naturally occurring gas in the human body, and it's a vasodilator. So it helps the blood flow more efficiently around the body. It helps the heart have to work less hard. The consequence of all that 
is that your body is less stressed and more relaxed. So you can just do a long, slow hum, as long as you can, then keep it comfortable, you don't have to exhaust your lung supply, and then gently breathe in through the nose to make sure you take advantage of that gas. Simple stuff. Breathing. Breathing less, focusing on the breath, and taking advantage of the mechanics of humming. There's lots of other things you can do with breath, but we'll just keep it simple. Sleep. Sleep is something that tortures many of us, right? But sleep, I don't know if you've read a book by, um, I think it's Dr. Matthew Walker, uh, called Sleep. It's a brilliant book, it's depressing as hell. Because basically it says that if you don't sleep enough, lots of really bad things are probably being stacked up for you. And you can't recover lost sleep over time either. So if you sacrifice your sleep as a young person, partying all night and things like that, you can't make up for it by sleeping when you're older. It doesn't work like that, apparently. So if you have not spent you, I'm terribly sorry because I've been doing it. It's a great book, but it is depressing as hell. Right. But quality of sleep is so important to our state of well-being. Our ability, therefore, to make changes. So again, if we haven't slept well, we're more likely to be stressed, we're more likely to be anxious, we're more likely to deviate from the changes that we're looking to make in life. So the better the quality of sleep we can enable, the better everything else is for us, generally speaking. Now, not everyone finds it easy to go to sleep. Not everyone finds it easy to stay asleep. My one top tip for this is to stop trying so hard. And there really is this sort of sense of non-resistance with a lot of stuff in our lives, with our mental health, particularly things like anxiety as well, right? When we're trying not to be anxious, we're trying not to be anxious, or trying not to be angry. It doesn't work, it builds pressure. The same thing if we're trying to force ourselves to sleep. When we're going through counting down hours till we've got to get up and go to work, or whatever it is, or we just haven't slept through at night. If we can just let go of pressuring ourselves to go to sleep, and instead focus on something simple like the breath, the experience of the breath of the nose, just see what happens. Worst case scenario, you'll have a lovely meditative breathing exercise going for you all night, which won't be that bad. But you'll probably find that you drop off to sleep quite a lot easier. Yes? Has he had a preferred number of hours per might be this idea seven hours, no more. I love people who say eight, eight is good, eight and a half is good. I think Matthew Walker says eight, I think. Yes. It's seven or eight. Um, and that is actually sleep not in bed time, right? So if you take two hours to go to sleep when you get to bed, that doesn't count. So that's, uh, that's, that's what the sleep doctors say. Um, and I, yeah, who am I to argue? Exactly, but no, exactly. But the key thing, the, the, the problem with these things, and these sort of, you know, when we're told to eat 62 vegetables a week and all those sorts of things as well, right, is that it puts pressure on ourselves. And so we have pressure that we have to be a certain way, otherwise, you know, we're not going to be as healthy as we can be. And, you know, oh, I don't know. There's something new with it. I think it's sort of oily fish. Oily fish has always been something that's super healthy. I think they came out in the news this week and said it's, if you eat more than two portions of oily fish a week, there's some statistical anomaly somewhere that says that you'll die or something. I mean, it's just bizarre, right? So you just, you know, you've got to, you've got to let go. You've got to let go of a lot of it, actually, because it'll just tie you in knots. <laughs> so the one thing that will keep you awake at night is trying to go to sleep and thinking, crikey, if I don't get enough sleep, it's going to be terrible. So actually, see if you can just let go of needing to be asleep. Now, you need, you know, I'm not encouraging you to stay awake at night, right? but actually just stop trying to go to sleep and just see what happens. I don't know if you remember um, that did like um, midnight feasts when you were a kid or something like that. It was a nightmare trying to stay awake for those. <laughs> you wanted to stay awake, you had something to stay awake for and you just couldn't, right? So it is this, Dr. Uh, uh, Victor Frankl, I don't know if you had any read his work, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, he was a, a, a Jewish psychiatrist who was captured by the Nazis and put in many concentration camps, the lucky man, uh, including Auschwitz, and he talks about paradoxical intention. So he managed to survive, fortunately, and he attributed that to 
his sense of purpose that he had in his work. He'd written a script that he smuggled into the camp that he then lost so that one of the guards found it and destroyed it. Now that could have crushed him probably quite easily, but he didn't. He decided at that point, or he attributes his survival to the fact that he decided he had to survive to get his work out of the camp, because the work was then only in his head. And he did. But that's a side, that's, that's a digression. He talks about paradoxical intention, which is the idea that the opposite of what you want to achieve is how you elicit the behaviour. So if, you want, if you're trying to stop being anxious, you tell yourself to be as anxious as possible. I want to feel as anxious as possible. Or if you're angry, you know, if you don't want to be angry, you're telling yourself, I must be as angry as possible. You have to go full on hold. And the same with sleep. Right? If you want to go to sleep, you tell yourself, I've got to stay awake, I've got to stay awake. That's the principle of paradoxical intention. But it's the idea of not creating this pressure situation on what you want to achieve. Nutrition. So again, I'm not a registered nutritionist. I have a partner in crime who talks about the gut biome. Um, but again, what we eat and what we drink is very significant for our sense of well-being. And we can all influence that. Now we might not choose to, right? We might all have a terrible week to caper out from and all those sorts of things, right? And you don't have to be a monk. But there are things that you can do, and it's not a dark art, although people do keep changing their mind about what you should and shouldn't eat, you know? oily fish, for example. But there are things that we can do with our nutrition. What I would encourage you to do is to observe what the response is of your body when you eat something. Does it make you feel more energized? Does it make you feel more sleepy? Does it feel like lead in your stomach? Those sort of things might give you a clue as to the sort of things that your body is actually better able to tolerate and respond to well, rather than things that perhaps aren't serving it so well. So again, being a detective, being curious about your experience, about what happens, before you try and change anything. Actually, if you eat cake all the time and you feel amazing, this is not dietary advice, I stress. But if you feel amazing all the time, everything feels right, then maybe you're okay eating cake. Because <laughs> honestly, you know, how does your body respond? This isn't the same as intuitive well, because it is the sense of intuitive eating, right? And there's much maligned and there's lots of controversy around intuitive eating. But actually looking at what the response is of your body, what happens to your body? What happens to your body over time? You know, if you're eating cake and you're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you might need to think about that. But watch what's happening in the body. Watch the sensations you experience. How does it feel? Physical strength. Physical strength, particularly as we get older in life, is critical. And it's something that people have been, I think, terrified of. And I think maybe largely down to the likes of Stallone and Schwarzenegger and the steroid pumping of the 80s, right? where people thought that being strong meant you looked like a Hulk. Particularly women. Women are terrified often of lifting weights because they don't want to look beefy. It will not happen. You have to train insanely hard. You have to be ridiculously strict in your nutrition. And a lot of them are taking steroids to look that way. You will not accidentally look like Arnie or a bodybuilder. It will not happen. But lifting weights, doing strength work, is fundamental to your ability to avoid frailty later in life. If you're not already at a gym or picking stuff up at home, because you don't have to have a gym, you can do stuff at home, bags for life, and start putting cans in them one at a time, make sure your bag for life is strong enough. You can start something simple with a bag for life, picking it up, lifting it overhead if your shoulders allow, putting it down, repeat. Okay? It's not necessarily very sexy. You might not enjoy it, but the dividend returns on it are massive. Think of it as paying into a pension pot. I don't think it's excited about paying into a pension pot, but you do it because you hope that it will deliver for you in the future. Try and adopt this principle with your physical well-being, with the behaviors that you want to change. It's an investment into the future you. An investment so you can be better to take care of the people that you want to take care of.
And the fifth and final one, although again, they're not in any particular order, mental resilience, our ability to deal with the vicissitudes of life, the changes and the uncertainties of life are critical. The more comfortable we are with the concept of change, the happier we are. Now, we're wired to not like change, because we want stability, we want security and safety. And that's why we watch the news, because it tells us all the dangers that are waiting for us, right? so that we can prepare for them, right? so that we can shore up against Russia or whatever. That's what's happening, right? But actually, if we can become mentally resilient, mentally flexible through practices such as mindfulness or breath work, or developing a deeper understanding of human psychology so that you understand that your behaviours aren't erratic and irrational, they might be helpful, that all your behaviours you're doing are trying to protect you, are trying to serve you, no matter how poorly that might ultimately be working out. If it's working out badly, it's because you've got outdated um, software, outdated, outdated data programs that you're working from. So if you can learn more about human psychology, learn more about how the human brain works, the emotions that are driving you, you stand a better chance of updating that software, updating that program, which will give you a better sense of your mental landscape. So, those are the five pillars. And so, yes, so these are things that we can all do ourselves, right? To a greater level extent. And, you know, some things, and, and the internet is an amazing thing if you have access to it. And, you know, there's YouTube videos that will tell you everything. Um, they really are. We can find a coach to help you shortcut some of these things, should you wish. But doing some simple breath work, breathing less. We'll do, we'll do that exercise in a minute. We've got a few minutes left. Doing some breath work will really help the quality of your, your cardiovascular function. It'll help you sleep better, which will reduce your blood pressure, which will reduce your stress. Right? Ding, 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 ding. Just all cause betterment, right? From something simple to breathing and then sleeping better. Watching what you eat and being more and more more conscious about what you eat, without just calling yourself a knot, without making yourself anxious about it, but being more discerning about some of your nutritional choices, perhaps. If you're not already a monk with your nutrition, you might well be. Physical strength, doing some exercise of some description, or, you know, I mean, again, if you're doing lots of, you know, hard labour, if you're doing a lot of sort of tough gardening or building work, and that's obviously fine as well, right? But stuff that actually works your strength. And please, 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 don't worry about looking like some muscly hulk thing. It's not going to happen unless you really, really want it to. And you put in a hell of a lot of effort. Same nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, right. If anyone's still awake, I see most of you are. We're just going to do a little breath game. Alright, so we're going to do small breath holds. Now, this is completely safe unless you're in your first trimester of pregnancy. So, if anyone's in your first trimester of pregnancy, please declare now. Um, and it's your partner's here, we haven't told them. So, all we're going to do is slow breathing with some small pauses. You shouldn't feel dizzy, you shouldn't feel sick. You shouldn't feel like you have them relaxed and possibly be slightly sleepy. But if you do, please open your eyes and stop. You do it with your eyes open, your eyes closed, it doesn't matter. All we're going to do is we're going to take three normal breaths in through the nose. So in and out at whatever rate is right for you. You've been sat down for a while now, so hopefully it's fairly relaxed. Three breaths. One, two, three. Slower than that, this is just. And then on the third breath, as you breathe out, so your lungs are emptying, and not forced emptying, just naturally breathing out. <coughs> End of the out breath, pause. And hold the out breath for a count of three to five beats. 
and then breathe in again and repeat. So three normal, comfortable breaths. Pause on the out breath. Three to five minute beats. Breathe in again. Any questions? Sorry? Maybe we call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if it is irritating you, hopefully it won't, then don't feel pressured to do it. <laughs> you can start more gently. <laughs> Alright, so in your own time, I can't see you doing it on and you can't see me doing it. It's the joy of breath work, it's terrible for demonstrations. Right? So just in your own time, start breathing gently through the nose, count of three breaths, and then on the third out breath, pause for three to five beats, gently breathe in again. You do it with eyes open, eyes closed. While you're doing this, try and focus on the physical experience of the breath. Physical experience at the end of the nose, so maybe cold air coming in, warm air leaving again, the sensations across the cheeks, the bridge of the nose, in the throat. And you can do this for as long as you like, right? Three to five minutes is a good practice time which won't actually take you very long because the breaths are relatively slow and steady. So you probably only do two to three rounds of that. But you can do it as often as you want. It will hopefully help you sleep at night, so if you're struggling to get to sleep, you can try this exercise. If you find your mind anxious in the morning when you wake up, try this exercise. If you're awake in the middle of the night and can't sleep, try this exercise. So just do one more cycle of that breathing pattern, and then all around. Thank you. If you try it. How does, does anyone want to share how that was for them? Is there no pressure to? I don't want people on the spot, but how, did anyone find it relaxing? <laughs> Did anyone find it stressful? Good. Hopefully not. Good. And no one felt dizzy or faint. I know you had a bit of a cough situation. I managed. Good. Oh. Yes. Um, one of the techniques I was taught when I was doing my training was um, I can't remember the, I think it was called 7 Eleven or something. It was sort of breathing in and then breathing out more slowly, so breathing in through your nose and breathing out more slowly through your mouth, sort of pursing your mouth. I don't know if that's something that you also suggest um, as a maternity. <coughs> there, there are so many different variations. Yeah. My, my response to most of these things is if you find it works for you, then absolutely. Right? At the end of the day, I think that the most powerful thing is to breathe slower. Okay, that's really the key thing. So when people say, calm you down, know, when you're super stressed and having a panic attack, people say, take deep breaths, big breaths. What you actually want to take is slow breaths. Okay, so deep's fine, but actually it's better to focus on slow. Slow gives the lungs more time to exchange the gases. Okay, the carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange happens more efficiently because there's more time. And you find this when you're exercising, right? If you, if you are, you know, you get to the point in exercise, if you're running or jogging or cycling or whatever, or doing gardening too hard, your breathing becomes more and more laboured. It, it reaches a point where it becomes less and less efficient. Okay, it's an optimal rhythm, and actually the slower you can breathe, particularly with exercise, right? You know, even when exercising, the slower you can breathe, the better. Because it gives the body longer to exchange the gases, get the carbon dioxide out, get the oxygen in. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the breathing sort of, um, the breathing pattern I've learned is from a guy called Patrick McEwen, who's got a, a program called Oxygen Advantage, uh, and it's based on a, a, a historical pattern of breathing called the Taco, which is essentially breathing less. Um, and he's very sort of passionate about breathing in and out of the nose, that's the, you know, the optimal method of breathing. However, oftentimes, because we don't breathe maybe through the nose as much as we should, our nose can feel congested and it can feel quite difficult to breathe through the nose. And you'll notice maybe in the morning, if your nose is stuffy in the morning when you get up, it means you've been mouth breathing at night. And if you've been mouth breathing at night, you've been enjoying this lovely, trying to have restful sleep, 
but actually you've been adopting a slightly stressed physiological response because you're mouth breathing. So if you can either get a snore guard, chin strap kind of thing, very sexy they are, or a little bit of micro core tape, put it over your lip to keep your mouth shut at night, and help, again, quality sleep. Hello, yes? Do they also emphasize more with the outbreath, particularly with the potato, because when people are stressed, they tend to breathe in more, emphasize that, and hold on to breath. Whereas, as you say, when you breathe out thoroughly, it gives the body the time to do the oxygen exchange more efficiently. Yes. Yeah, I mean, normally people are over breathing, right? So actually, we're over oxygenating ourselves, and that's what hyperventilation is it's a panic attack, it's, it's, it's too much oxygen, not enough carbon dioxide. And what happens when you, when you are over breathing regularly, you're actually decreasing your body's tolerance to carbon dioxide. Now, you think that's a good thing, you think more carbon dioxide is poisonous, but well, actually, it's not. It's, you know, it's a gas part of the process in the body. But actually, it's our tolerance to carbon dioxide that determines our panic with the breath. And if, we, if we're continually over-breathing, our tolerance gets less and less and less, so the body thinks it needs to breathe more and more and more, so you end up in this continual sort of negative spiral of breathing where it gets harder and harder. And people fight with asthma and things like that, and experience problems with it, allergies and things like that, and again, they end up with this, it's an over-breathing pattern that becomes really out of control. So yes, so focusing on slow out of breath is normally a good thing to do, rather than focusing on the in-breath, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Can, I, can you explain why you need to breathe through your nose? What's the difference? <sighs> so, yes, good question, thank you. Oh, there was a heart of me thinking of the answer, not a heart of the question. Oh God, oh yeah. <laughs> You breathe in an active, so the nose was designed for breathing. The mouth is a backup, if you like, in case the, the nose is blocked or obstructed. It's also as well, the, mouth. the mouth is also eating and talking and a few other things, probably. But yeah, so the, the, the sinuses in the nose, um, again, are, are responsible for filtering um, viruses and bacteria. So, just on the off chance that there's a pandemic anywhere, you are less likely. <laughs> to catch a virus or a cold, a cold season, if your nose breathing rather than mouth breathing, for example, right? So there's a lot of bacteria and viral filtration that goes on in the body um, that's important there. It helps use the nitric oxide, which is by the mass if you use the mouth to breathe there. And I think also critically, mouth breathing is a stress response. So physiologically, if you, I mean, again, you see it when, you see it in athletes when they're spent, right? So, uh, if any of you watch boxing to any, any degree, the commentators point out when one of the fighters is mouth breathing and they know that that fighter is in trouble. The breathing is no longer efficient, it's not in control, and they will be feeling more and more stressed. A, because their breath is dysregulated, it's out of control, and yeah, so the, the mouth breathing is a stress response. Does that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello. So we're all aware of the dangers of not enough sleep. Yes. Are there any dangers of too much sleep? <laughs> Are there dangers of too much sleep? Other than losing time during the day. Losing time during the day. Yeah, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I, do, I do believe Matthew Walker talks about it in his book, but I, I don't think he encourages you to have more than nine hours sleep. So, and I think the reason is about establishing a regular, breathing, a regular sleep pattern. So when you wake up, your, the, the circadian rhythm starts going again. Okay, so you wake up, the, the sleep hormones are depleted, and you'll wake up and you feel great and ready for the day. That's what we all do. We all bounce out of bed, we all do zing and thin, and then we catapult ourselves through the day until we're ready to sleep again. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, this will sleep for another three hours, that's how it goes. <laughs> but yeah, you can, I mean, you can over sleep, and typically, I mean, again, there's always exceptions, right? But typically, Oversleeping signifies some sort of psychological challenge. So often it's associated with depression. For example, if you are, you know, if you're spending 10, 12 hours in bed or more on a regular basis, it's probably because you're avoiding the experience of the day. Now, if but I'm not an expert on that side of things, I and mean, if you are finding yourself naturally sleeping 12 hours a day, I mean, maybe you have to your doctor and see if they're concerned. They might say yes, or they might say no. That's not a very helpful answer for you, but, but if someone, I mean, typically, from a mental health perspective, typically if someone's spending an awful lot of time in bed, 
um, it can signify something going on. Thank you. Hello. Um, you mentioned on your sheet here you've got no really good changes possible, and um, you mentioned that we may be able, when um, we think about it, when we are able to apply principles to change old habits. But that when we get in stressful situations or you know too much demands are made on us, then we might revert back to old habits, which are unhealthy. Yeah. Do you have any techniques that you encourage people to use that if they are trying to change, to stop them going back into those bad habits that they want to avoid? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So. One of the key things is to reassure people that actually it's okay to fail from time to time because you will fall back on those old habits at some point, almost certainly. It's really unlikely that you will have 100% success straight away. So actually a, a large part of it is reassuring yourself that it's okay to fail, not giving you, a, a, you know, an excuse to just keep eating cake whenever you feel like it, but if you've been making your, I use cake as an example because it's something I struggle with. <laughs> it's um, so it's, it's letting yourself know that you are likely to come off the wagon at some point and you just need to put yourself back on it and continue progressing. Because the more and more you repeat the practice, the stronger those pathways will become. In terms of things that you can do more proactively, Development of mindfulness is really an excellent way because mindfulness, if you haven't explored it, helps you kind of see what's happening emotionally and mentally more real time. So oftentimes we're washed away with our emotions, washed away in our thoughts, we're lost in the movie theatre of our lives. And so when we're stressed in particular, we're more likely to fall into that trap, we fall into default patterns, routines. Um, so the more practice the more skilled we are in mindfulness, awareness of our experience, the, the less likely that is to happen. And again, it still doesn't mean it won't happen, right? I mean, we are only rational as long as our lives are stable around us, right? We're all sitting in here rationally because everything's fine and calm, the walls are here, and, you know, no one's walking in with a machete. If someone came in with a machete, it would transform everything, right? You know, <laughs> you go from being in a stable environment to what the hell's going on. And, and so the same is true in our lives for everything, right? We rely on the stability of the structure of our lives to give us a safe platform to build from. And when that safe platform is threatened by overwhelming circumstances, and you know, someone's shouting at us, or you know, someone's got ill, or our, our job's gone wrong, or there's something wrong with our house, all these sort of things that are secure to us, that we work so hard to create a stable base of security, when those things which you know, when those things are threatened, they have a massive detrimental effect on us, which is why things like the water are really stressful, moving house is really stressful, changing jobs is quite stressful, right? It's those, it's those fundamental foundational things in our life that we sort of adhere to, that we cling to our identity to, that we look for safety in, and when they're disrupted, they kind of shape us the most. So, so yes, I would say giving, giving yourself, you know, permission to fail occasionally is gonna happen, it's not an excuse to fail, but permission to fail and get back on. And the development of mindfulness where possible, so that you are more proactive in the ability to navigate the emotions as they arise. Does that help? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, focusing on the circles, the five circles. Yes. Um, I notice they're very much things which you do with and for yourself. Yes. Um, now maybe I'm straight into the hexagons a bit, but it seems to me that you can't have well-being without rewarding contacts with others. And I just wonder if you might respond to that. Yeah, thank you. It, it, yeah, that's a, it, it's a really interesting point. And, and I do believe that you need wholesome contact with others for, for a, a real sense of well-being. We are social creatures, we are a social species. And you know, one, of the, one of the things I think that causes us most suffering is this obsession with the I, you know, the me and my needs and my success and all those things rather than actually seeing ourselves as more of a community and a community success. 
the point with the, the five pillars is that they're all within your control directly. Okay? And by establishing those and, and having a better sense of well-being in yourself, and particularly with your mental landscape, although I, I, I acknowledge and figure there's no that, you are more likely to be able to establish wholesome relationships and wholesome connections with people. The more secure you feel in yourself, the, 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 the happier you will be to actually reach out to others and connect to others. The, the more threatened you feel, the more insecure, the more anxious you are, the more you're likely to isolate, and the more that loneliness is likely to be a factor in your life. And, and that's, yeah, that's what I see working with the demographic that I've been working with. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Thank you. Anyone else? Hello. Um, this week on the BBC, there was a report that said they felt that if people have sudden shocks or they're in some terrible emotional turmoil and their brain is spilling and spilling and kind of getting out of control, that they are damaging not only their um, uh, mind, if you like, they're damaging the, the way their heart works and also the way the uh, brain works, and they're actually damaging those parts of their body as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's come out as a very clear recognition of some of the things that you've been talking about. But I think most people don't know much about how to control things um, you know, when, they're, when they get into these states after sudden shocks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it, it sounds like, and I don't, I don't see that particularly, so I don't know, but I mean, it, it sounds like we're talking about trauma, I think, specifically. And trauma is something that I'm very interested in conceptually, and that is really these, you know, deeply shocking circumstances that actually do, you know, throw our sense of certainty and our regulation out the window, and they can have a very detrimental effect to our ability to process um, data after that, so our ability to interpret the world that we see in front of us changes dramatically after a traumatic event, um, and it does affect the heart. So you've got the, uh, the polyvagal theory, the, the, the vagus nerve, and I'm not an expert on this, I've made talk very lightly around it, but you know, the, 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 there's nerves that run you know, from the brain down the spinal column and they connect the heart and the gut, um, and, and they connect all the organs in the body. But the, these absolutely, again, get um, they become dysregulated, they become dysfunctional to a point after prolonged periods of stress. And, and yes, you will, you, as a consequence, you are likely to have high blood pressure, high risk of heart disease, and high risk of, of all sorts of exciting cancers and things like that, where it really can make a mess of you. So, you know, so yeah, life, life, life is stressful. There's degrees, right? So there's obviously there's, there's trauma. A trauma can arise in people for, for all sorts of reasons, and you can have obviously horrific circumstances like school shootings that can cause or really cannot cause trauma in people. And this is always very interesting, seeing how some people sort of cope with certain situations and, and move on, say, unscathed in quotes, but without experiencing the, the, the symptoms of trauma. And some people can go through a relatively minor incident and become deeply affected by it as well. So, so what can you do about it to protect yourself from it? I mean, you can't, you can't protect yourself from the world. The more you're trying to protect yourself from things that are unlikely to happen, the more anxious you're going to be as a default. So actually you're going to create more problems for yourself over time. And this is one of the things I'm concerned about with sort of the, the mass media sort of focus on the, the terrible things in the world all the time, that we're constantly in this state of threat. And it's constantly a threat that we can't do anything about. It's essentially, right? We can't do anything about the war in Ukraine, right, as individuals. Can't do anything about global warming as individuals. Can't do anything. There's all these existential threats that we can't necessarily directly do anything about at this moment in time. But we sit there, obviously worried about it, because we're told that it's going to kill us, potentially, right? So, so yes. Yeah, so, you know, one of the key things is, is trying to keep focusing on the things that you can control in your life. And this comes back to sort of senses of local community and things like that. And I encourage people where possible, it's easy to say, we get lost in the emotion of everything, right? Naturally, we're drawn to it like possible <coughs> flame. But 
Focusing on the things that you can control and change, particularly in your local community, will give you a much better sense of well-being and that will have a, a protective effect. The more connected you feel to people around you and the more secure you are in your own sense of well-being, the more resilient you're likely to be to things. If you already feel that you're on the very edge of everything um, and something else happens, you know, like you, you, you tap starts leaking or whatever, it can be, you know, you can destroy the brakes that count as that. Did I answer your question in any yeah. sensible way? Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'll, I'll hold on to you in a second. Yeah, I'm <laughs> 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 not interrupting you. Um, yeah, well, I, mean, I thought sort of loads of good advice that you were giving. That a lot of which is common with other people. Um, it's interesting your sort of starting point of what can we do to change, because that implies that we all have some big sense of lack, you know, which we do more or less at different times of our life. Um, and I mean, I, I, I've been reading a lot of mindfulness stuff um, by a guy called Eckhart Tolle recently. And reading that way, where he's really saying the self, the ego, is a kind of unreal thing, mm -hmm. and you can achieve mindfulness by detaching yourself from the ego. In a way, I wonder if this thing of, you know, this is how to change to make yourself a better self, you know, it, it can easily be part of this kind of false ego thing that like I'm going to move up from the uh, little car I drive to a Rolls Royce and then I'll have this perfect self. Uh, you, you know, what, what do you think about that, about the, the whole use of the word self and self-improvement? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question and it's, and it's something that I struggle with as well, right? Because as, as a mindfulness practitioner and teacher, there is very much the sort of letting go of the, the ego, the sense of self, and there is this notion that we're all okay as we are. What the focus is actually, I believe, focuses, and I think this is something Sam Harris talks about a lot as well, is that we have to accept the moment as it is. So you here and now as you are, is the only here now you that you can be. Right? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't aspire to improve ourselves in conjunction with our values. Right? And I, I, you know, I firmly believe that if you're completely content with yourself and you're not messing up anyone else's life, then all power to you. So there's no, you know, there's no obligation if you're not leaving a trail of destruction in your way, right? Okay. And there's degrees of the trail of destruction, right? But actually, most of us probably have some difficult relationships. Most of us don't do everything that we wish maybe we did do in certain contexts and situations, right? Most of us might wish that we are, you know, fitter or stronger in certain respects or that you know some skills you don't know, right? It comes down to your, your personal values. These are individual and there's no, I said there's no right or wrong, there are right and wrong values in the pur purpose of you know, <laughs> the greater good of humanity, of course, right? But, you know, they're your values and if, if your values are you know, whatever they are, that's, that's okay. Now, mindfulness is about accepting the moment and letting be and not putting too much pressure on yourself because you don't want to be putting so much pressure on yourself to do something that you're just making yourself sick. That's counterproductive. So, it's finding, and again, which is why you start gently and with small baby steps, find something that hopefully interests you or at least that you recognise the benefit of. So again, if people don't like physical exercise and the concept of lifting weights fills them with, you know, nothing but bile, for example, and that's quite a common response, which is why I use it, then start small. Don't you know? That's that's the key thing. And just see how it see how it goes. Actually, you might find if you start lifting a few weights, actually it's not that bad, right? But if you go and you try and lift heavy, you're going to get someone to push you on your first go, and it goes wrong when you end up hurting for six weeks. It's not going to encourage you to do it again. Does that help answer the question or not really? Well, I mean, okay, another way of looking at the same thing yeah. is we're humanists, you know, so we don't believe in this sort of big cog out there mm. of people are trying to contact. And that maybe the downside of humanism is you 
think, oh well, well right, we will rationally sort out everything, you know, scientifically, rationally, we will make ourselves and the world a better place. And that's a fairly hopeless and overambitious kind of task, you know, um, I think. So, I mean, I mean, all these things that you're saying are good, but they do, to me, imply a sort of the arrogant side of humanism, maybe as well. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and I suppose that, that's, a, that's something that you have to sit with personally. Uh, and, and, and again, I think that's, that's down to, to how, you, how you want your experience of the world to be. And, and, and you can you know, aspire to make things better, you can also make things worse through trying to make things better, right? So there's plenty of examples of that happening, right? So, um, but I think, you know, aspiring to do better for yourself so that you can take better care of the people that mean something to you, I, I find, you know, that personally I find hard to argue against, but, but yeah, but you know, each their own. And, and I know that on the, on the, on the strong side of mindfulness, and this is a very much I say it's the spiritual side of mindfulness, I know it's not exclusively that. You know, there is a lot of focus on this sense of self allowing to be, you know, non, non striving, non, non being egotistical. And, and as I say, that's something that I wrestle with in my personal mindfulness practice versus, yeah, person, versus a, a, an egotistical desire to be a better person in, in what I do, a better, a better coach and a better partner to my wife and a uh, better human being to people around me, I hope. But yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a conundrum. I don't have a good answer for you. Thank you for the question. Hello. Hello again. I've got no wish to pry. Um, <laughs> but, but, but how do you compare your life now with your corporate life, and would the two have been compatible? <laughs> well, uh, would the two have been compatible? Um, I, I have a far deeper sense of fulfillment and satisfaction doing what I'm doing now than I ever did in the corporate sector. It's, um, and, and other people recognise that change as well. So it's not just a personally experienced change, you know, it's something that people who knew me before comment on and my wife's very grateful for. Um, so, but are they compatible? I, I have thought about going back to prove that it works because. It's easy to sort of you know preach something when you're in a good place, but can you you know can I can I do it from the prison camp for example you know Victor Frankl style and, and things like that um, and yeah and that's a question because yes it's you know these these, these self styled you know well being gurus who come and tell you all these good things that you can do not living in the real world but yeah exactly with, you know it, it's it's a it's a valid question and I've thought about going back to the bank but I'm moving forward instead and. I'm, Looking to study more psychology and moving to clinical psychology is my ambition. Um, so I'll know then. But I mean, I still face what I can tell you is my my wife, who has received a lot of benefit from the skills that I've been <laughs> practicing, has applied these in her work environment, and she has noticed, and her colleagues have noticed significant changes in her as a result of the, of the practices and the effort that she's been putting in. So, yes, it does work in that context. Thank you. All right. And you have questions? Yeah, and also some of the question is, I mean, I may have problems and things, but um, it was sort of a permission, really. This business of getting on with people and all of that. And suddenly, I've I read somewhere that if somebody really is affecting you badly, not a personal relationship, but in a group or something like that, then just move away. Don't try, don't keep trying to get on with them and all of that. Write it off because there comes a point when you can do no more. And I found that really helpful at the time because I was having problems. Yes, thank you. And yeah, and, and I think that's absolutely right. You know, we can't connect with everybody. So again, we're a social species, but I think the, the social model is about 200 people. Again, sort of historical tribal kind of concept that, you know, we, so, you know, living in these 
you know, wonderful big towns. I think we've got 300,000 people across Paul Bournemouth and Christchurch. But you don't know anybody. Well, you know, you know, you walk down the street, you're not likely to know anybody necessarily. Um, and you can't, you don't form those sort of community connections in the same way. And it has a, a strong, I think, detriment, you know, to our well-being. But that said, there's a lot of good things to it, right? So you wouldn't want to be without your towns in one way because they give you a lot of stuff. Otherwise, you wouldn't live here, right? Moved away somewhere else that you felt was more appropriate for you, or most of you would have done, given the choice. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely, we can't connect with everybody, and we shouldn't try to connect with everybody, really, he says, unless, you know, unless, unless again, that's a really critical value to you and you're not just annoying them by doing so. Um, but no, so yeah, letting go of things that you can't change is a critical step to well being and will really help you reduce sort of anxiety and those sorts of symptoms as well, because it's, it's the, the pressures that we put ourselves on ourselves. To, to be a certain way or to engage with people that, that when it doesn't work, it doesn't feel like it works, sets out of, of the negative feedback loop because this, you know, the, the chemical responses in the body that then make us feel negative, make us feel sad, make us feel bad. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? You've been very excellent so far. Hello. Uh, what are the tips for mental resilience? I don't know if you just get distracted with that. What is mental resilience? What are your tips and practice? Yeah, so mindfulness as a skill, I strongly recommend. And if you've tried mindfulness before and it hasn't worked for you, I, and this isn't just trying to sell my own business, I would encourage you to try it with someone else because there are different styles of mindfulness and teachers have a very personal way of delivering it. And I, I do think that mindfulness is for almost everybody. Um, so mindfulness helps you step back a little from the emotional landscape that you're facing and helps you not get lost to the story of the thoughts that are happening so that you're then more likely to be able to make a discerning decision. Uh, and that's save you all the time from everything, but it improves your odds. All these things, everything's about improving your odds, right? You can do all the right things, you can get killed by a swan. <laughs> yes? So in the past, when I was practicing my mindfulness, it's a case of having something that I wanted to achieve in the back of my mind, and then the practice involved emptying your mind, and going into some, what perhaps something like meditation, rather than mindfulness, perhaps I don't know the difference. Mm. Um, I think it was meditation, maybe. Okay. An easy kind of meditation, it doesn't have to be transcendental. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I used to find that quite useful because I had something I wanted to achieve mm -hmm. to get into a sort of peaceful state of mind. And okay. um, I should get rid of all the rubbish and garbage that is filling one's mental awareness, sort of cleaning, cleaning the brain out in a way. But I guess that's meditation rather than mindfulness. Yeah, and again, there's, there's different flavours of lots of these things, right? There's lots of different styles of breath work, and there's definitely a huge range of meditations and mindfulness practices. And again, my response is, if it works for you, then run with it. So if you've got a practice that's working for you, and it's you know, helping you do what it is you want to do, and be less difficult with people around you in your lives, then fantastic. Go for it. Um, my understanding of mindfulness and the mindfulness that I teach is about you're not trying to change anything, um, which is obviously you know, contrary to talking about how to make change. But you're not trying to change anything at the moment, you're trying to be with the experience that you're in. But by noticing it, it loses its power, its potency in a sense. So if you, and there's a, there's a, a lovely exercise you can practice um, called the letting go technique, but it's a bit rooted in mindfulness. And basically, you think of, of, of something that gives you an emotional response. And that can be, it can be any emotion. You can, I mean, it's easier, in a sense, to work with like, anger or anxiety. But you can work with happiness, believe it or not. You can actually you can work with happiness if you choose to. You think of something that creates an emotional response in you. So you might think of an argument you've had with someone, or you might think of someone who's really special to you in your life and makes you happy. You imagine that, however you imagine things, you know, using uh, whether that's through you know, visual images in the mind or uh, senses of sounds or, or what have you. And 
you're looking for the body to start developing an emotional response. So, for example, if it's something, something that makes you happy, you might feel you know, your mouth start to lift a little bit, the jaw relax, you might feel a, a nice sensation in the tummy. If it's anger, you might feel a tightness in the chest, a tightness in the stomach. You're looking for those physical sensations, the body's physical response to the emotion. And then you stop imagining the scenario and you watch what happens to the sensations in the body. And what you find is they disappear almost immediately. And so what that sort of demonstrates is, is the, what happens in mindfulness. So if you actually just watch the situation of your body, your emotions, the thoughts, and you don't attach to them, you don't feed them with more thoughts, they just disappear. So, you can, so you, you, you're not pushing anxiety away, you're not pushing anger away, you're just allowing it to be, and like a fire without any fresh oxygen, it just fizzles out. So, so yeah, so to answer your original question, I recommend mindfulness for mental resilience, and I recommend learning as much as you can about human psychology um, and why the brain does what it does and how, why you behave the way you do because that builds a sense of compassion for yourself and helps you identify behaviours that might be undesirable but helps you realise that they're all coming from a place of, of desiring to do good for you, believe it or not, or protect you in some way. And so that, again, helps you deal with the challenges of life. Hello. Yes, hello. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> Actually, I've got two questions. Okay. The first one relates to uh, interest section. And um, you seem to be advocating um, that one develops uh, an introspective examination of one's feelings, emotions, and reactions, and responses, and all those things. Do you think there's a danger in doing that? Yes. I'd love to do And the second question, obviously. Get that up, 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 it's a, a simple question at first. How much value um, um, do you think that one can get from a, a close relationship with pets and animals? I mean, we are the greatest dog lovers in the world, right? Yeah. We have all the things. Yeah. Our coffee and food who pass off, um, people with dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions. So, can you be too introspective? Yes, you can. Right? And yes, you can absolutely just get lost in it, because you, you can't think your way out of an emotional situation, which is what people tend to try and do, right? We think because we're rational people, because we're rational people, we like to think that we can think our way out of a problem, we can think our way past our emotions, and we basically can't, and we demonstrate that to ourselves time and time again, yet we refuse to accept it, and we keep trying to think our way out of a situation. So, so being introspective is part of the process, but it doesn't stop there. So you need to be a detective to certain behaviours to, to develop a map, but then you want to find some way of doing something about those behaviours if you want to. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're just studying yourself, just studying yourself, probably not. Um, because yeah, you're just going down a rabbit hole and you're not necessarily changing anything. So I say that. Um, dog lovers, yeah, you can absolutely, yes, I mean, you can absolutely establish, you know, good, nourishing relationships with, with pets, and people do it all the time. So, and, and, and often, oftentimes, if you see people with a, an abundance of animals, you will find that they are using them to compensate for an absence of human relationship. That happens. Doesn't mean it's happening all the time, I'm not accusing anyone of anything. And it's not a negative thing. Right? But it, it happens. And, and, and yes, they are, but they are in several so If they work for you, if it makes you happy, and you're comfortable with your animals, then you're very quick. Can I just say this? Okay. Uh, in the American corporate environment, and I've spent nearly 20 years working in America, um, it's increasingly common um, for, um, for staff to be encouraged, not just invited, but encouraged, to bring their pets to work in the office. And then have the um, and the animals, um, primarily dogs, canines, are, um, are encouraged to actually stay with the staff member in question um, for the entire day, just uh, you know, sitting patiently by their feet under their desk. And, uh, 
and so forth. So um, that's a kind of a development, if you like, of the relationship um, with, that we have with animals. Um, you know, we might think of this as being very personal relationship we have in a, a hand in a, a domestic environment. But animals are increasingly being encouraged to, um, uh, to, to soften the or improve, benefit the working environment too. Yeah. Yeah, yes, thank you for sharing that. And, and I, I think I've heard some of that before. Yes, yeah, certainly not some of our direct experience, but bring, bring it back to work there. But what I think some of the stands out to me in that, what's happening in that concept is it's bringing together things in common. Right? So as long as you're not terrified of dogs, it's not the worst I bring my rock wilder in. But it's, it, it's, it's bringing that sense of commonality. It's bringing something that unites us together, right? So although you, know, you like to think that you're working in the same place, you've got something in common, and yes, you do. But what you can do then is you pick out all the differences. So what you do then is you bring in everyone's pets, and all of a sudden you're bringing in a new layer of commonality, which helps build connection and community. So that's why I think that sort of thing is a really good idea, conceptually. As long as we are not afraid of dogs. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, can I just ask, uh, I find that uh, latest species of uh, to be a people who are extremely self indulgent to take their animals to work, and they have got company in the And uh, also, that not everybody is comfortable around dogs, so therefore, they're being self Yes. Well, yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. yeah. If it's a bringing, it's like bringing your kids to work, say, right? But equally, it impact me who perhaps I oh, don't want children or can't have children. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated. It should be working. Should be working. I think we're out of time. Well, Laurie, well, thank you so much. Uh, you've been on your feet for one and a half hours, so I think it's time to give you a break. I think Laurie has, has touched on so many really fascinating things this afternoon. And uh, I think all of these things, we could, you know, we could spend hours talking about all of these things uh, in, in more depth. Um, but you've given us plenty to think about, and it's been a, 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 I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to what you've had to say, Laura. So please give Laura a big round. If you want to, uh, if you want to hear more of Laurie, uh, there is the East put something uh, coming up this Wednesday, 15th of June, at the Club Pub in Pool. So uh, that's something that you might want to look at, and you can also go over.